Well, Ata Marie, and thank you for joining us this morning for what I'm sure will be an insightful and engaging hour, exploring in particular the concept of resilience and why we might need to rethink what this means to thrive in leadership and life. My name is Penelope Barcellas, and on behalf of Global Women, I'm delighted to facilitate this morning's conversation with two outstanding thinkers and speakers. We've got Dr. Anita Sands, who is based in New York. Good afternoon, Anita. Yeah, all right, Penelope. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. And here in Auckland, New Zealand, we've got Dr. Alia Bojilova. Good morning, Alia. Yeah, all right, everyone. Good morning. Um, Anita and Alia are going to talk for about 30 minutes. Uh, then we're going to open the floor up to questions, uh, which you can ask. What I would ask you please to do is post your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as time will allow. Now, it's been an extraordinary year. I know that's a complete understatement, but it's been an extraordinary year for everyone everywhere in the world. It's absolutely disrupt disrupted everything as we know it. Anita, if I could start with you, how have you managed during this stressful and uncertain time? And what have, they, what have been the key observations you have made um, about people, communities and, and business? Well, thanks, Penelope. Well, first of all, it is just so wonderful to be back with the global women family. Um, and I hope some of my friends who I've met before are on, are on our call today, um, because I'm just a huge fan of all you gals. Um, you know, it's so Thank funny, you. Penelope, like, I think one of the last gigs I did before the world as we knew it changed was the global women event in in Auckland uh, around Yes, the IWD. IWD. Yeah. Yes, you were fantastic. <laughs> March 9th or something like that and like god I mean when you think about what has happened since that time but I can just say I haven't spent a month in New Zealand in February March of this year I look back on that moment and and, and those weeks and just treasure them it's like what I wouldn't give to be back uh, with all of you and one of the best things that's come out of that trip is my friend Alia Bajilova whom I had the great pleasure to meet while I was down there she and I did this really fun breakfast a uh, speaking gig on the topic of belonging and uh and we said, you know, something really interesting about our, you know, unique perspectives, we should kind of keep talking. And little did we know that the year was going to unfold the way it has and that we would find such occasion to bring our, our perspectives together. So to answer your question flippantly, how I've gotten through this year is a lot of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to get me through the count tonight before I elect Kanye yeah, West. Yeah, crazy. The something. gift that keeps giving. It's just this year is just literally the gift that keeps taking. Um, so, so no, but all joking aside, one of the reasons why Ali and I started working together was I came back from uh, New Zealand, headed into my board meetings in Silicon Valley at the end of March, you know, end of Q1. And it was clear that things were changing. Now, at that time, Penelope, of course, we didn't think we were looking at anything like what, what we have encountered. We sort of imagined that by the end of Q2 or Q3, we'd be back at work, the kids would be back to school. And of course, you guys in New Zealand have done a phenomenal job at managing this thing. Uh, I think it's safe to say the United States is somewhat at the other end of the spectrum. So life here is still very much disrupted. So what became clear to me as a business leader is that this was different, right? I mean, we, in particularly in Silicon Valley, we've been talking a really good game around disruption for a long time, right? We actually prided ourselves on being the, the great disruptors of the world. And, and yet everybody was feeling really, really disrupted. And it, and it was clear that this was different. So I started talking to Ali about it. You know, she's a psychologist to begin with and, and you know, amongst other things. But what it turns out Ali also is, is an expert in resilience, right? That's literally what she did her PhD in. And I said, Ali, what is like, why is, why is this, why does this feel so different? And she said, well, one of the reasons is that we are dealing with acute ambiguity here not just disruption as we traditionally would have thought about it. So I've then spent the last few months with Alia learning everything I can from her and, and the studies and work that she has done on military special forces. We've also been really lucky to, to work with your phenomenal All Blacks team um, because they too are a team that really know how to thrive when the pressure is on and against all odds sometimes, against Ireland sometimes. Um, but, but these are teams that go into conditions of uncertainty, ambiguity, 
pressure, not just with an expectation that they will endure it, but that they will actually thrive. So I've then spent uh, six months with Alia going, tell us what is the difference that makes the difference <laughs> for, your, for, for the teams that you have worked with and how can I take some of that uh, back into the boardroom? So that's what we're, we're hoping to share with uh, our good friends at Global Women today. So Alia, what's, thanks Anita. Alia, what's been your experience and your observations? I mean, obviously you've been based here, um, so quite a different experience to Anita in terms of the immediate environment. What have been your observations? Well, so I mean, interestingly, I've spent half of my time with a mind or with focus on the United States or North America, at least, where our partnership performs or operates most of the time. And on the other side of the continuum, Thankfully, within New Zealand, we have begun to reconnect with groups and organizations and individuals in face-to-face -face and, and, and sort of, you know, obviously shared environments, which has been incredible. So, for example, yesterday, without, without name dropping, but yesterday I spent the whole day with one of our leading organizations here in New Zealand, the executive leadership and senior leadership teams. And, and I almost have a bipolar experience of this crisis now. And that could be because, you know, I virtually live in two different spaces at the same time. So the experience has been one of overwhelming confusion, exhaustion, drain, depression, uh, incredible degrees of anxiety. And on the other hand, of the sorts of things that previously as a psychologist, practitioner, um, I have felt like I have had to put a lot of effort and a lot of investment in articulating. And that's the stuff of vulnerability, of connection, of belonging, of purpose, of curiosity. All of a sudden, and yesterday was a great case in point, we just spent 15 minutes with Anita connecting before this call. And I was sharing with her how the sort of stuff I'd normally rock up with and, and have to show endless examples of or models of was very intuitive and profoundly within the fingertips of everyone involved in this equation. And, and those were exactly those things, how important sense of vulnerability, connection, vision, and motion is for us to thrive. Um, so I'm actually... I'm very proud, granted I have a bit of an optimistic bias, I'm very proud of how we have gone about this thing. And by we, I mean us humans, you know, and, and I, by we, I mean many of our leaders who have approached us and are working along with us, seeking to find as many ways as possible to cut out the white noise, reinforce and deepen the connections, not just with the teams and not just for the purpose of productivity, but because they're beginning to understand the power of human connection and what this could do for us. So I'm on the one hand, profoundly empathetic, uh, and on the other hand, incredibly excited about where we could get with this thing. Um, yeah. So you brought up some really interesting um, terms um, and also this um, idea that people want to connect um, with, that, with that humanness. Um, and there's certainly been a lot of um, that very apparent in the leadership here in New Zealand that we've seen, and actually people have really gravitated towards it, and we've seen the outcome that that's had um, most recently, I guess, in our election. Can I ask you, from your experience, how do people, and they're coming to you obviously for advice, how do people reset from trauma and crisis, given that there are some fairly negative outcomes, you know, the heightened anxiety, which I've certainly experienced um, in young people, but how do they reset? What, what pathway do you set them on? Interestingly, irrespective of whether this is about the individual or about a team or about a large organization or community, it appears we all follow the same pattern. And that's, in fairness, people recover or shift away from trauma in very different ways. We always have known that we have a downward trajectory, which is post-traumatic stress versus post-traumatic growth, the upward trajectory. But when we do things well, we appear to always follow the same cadence. That's intuitive and sometimes experiential, but it's always the same. And we have called it the 4R cadence. So step one is recognizing, pausing long enough to recognize what has shifted for us in this context, what has shifted in our context. And we do this so that we know how we can stand firmly on the ground that we are, have found ourselves in. So step one is recognize what has shifted. Step two is reorient intention fully, as we call it, towards the opportunities that our environment presents for us, as opposed to away from the threats that we are trying to escape. The third and really important step to this equation is this thing that we call re-anchor. 
re-anchoring is profoundly important. And this is the space Anita and I have spent most of our time focusing on that concept of belonging, not just in terms of inclusion or diversity, but deep, meaningful belonging that allows every one of us to invest the fullness of our hearts, minds, and capabilities into whatever it is that we have committed ourselves. And all of these three steps, recognize, reorient, and re-anchor, precede the final, which is re-engage. And the reason why we're challenging us to do this and also taking a note of the number of times when teams, individuals, and organizations have done this well, is that the vast majority of us respond to crisis by wanting to dive into some kind of action. You know, we've got this good old bias for action thing going, but as we are busying ourselves being driven, we are missing out on all of the cues that our environment provides for us. We also are missing out on all of the cues that are emerging in the minds and hearts of those that we are sitting along with. And all of a sudden we are finding ourselves scattered across this enormously complex terrains, each and every one of us on a different plane of, a, of an enormously complex tectonic shift. So what's needed for us is to first pause long enough to see what has shifted before we continue on to that place of re-engaging with our proposition. Yeah. And so Anita, just picking up on those four R's, um, and it is so hard to pause, isn't it? That's such a difficult thing to think to do because you you if you do pause you think that you're failing and you've missed something but just Anita picking up on those four R's given that we have got a number of um, women leaders that are listening today how do you apply that to the workspace yeah so it's 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 critical it's critical first as a as a leader to know just in your own context what is it that strengthens you what depletes you what we, what we replenishes you right I mean and, and particularly for for women who are leaders because it's a little bit of you got to put on your own oxygen mask first right so many other people are dependent on us and you know I've noticed uh, Penelope as time has gone on here in the United States you really do start to see the fatigue setting in people are tired here uh, and you know and yet and I can see it in conversations I'm having I can see it across my boards I can see it within my own family and I challenge myself every day to see it in myself you know is this one is this one of the days where I feel like I've got a full you know tank of gas hitting you know as I start into my morning or is this one of these days where I sort of wake up and I think I've got a quarter or maybe less gas left in the tank and it's so important to recognize that so this is back to the first door is sort of you know is to recognize the the situation that you're in yourself because as we know we can't run on an empty tank for very long right uh, I don't know I, I was using this analogy the other day and I was like when I'm driving and I see the yellow light come on in my car I basically panic like I think I'm going to get stranded on the on some <laughs> highway which did actually happen to me once upon a time in Cuba whole other story glass of wine another day girls but um I, I literally panic. I think I am going to like run out of gas and not, you know, and yet we wake up in our own lives. We know we're running low on fuel and, and yet we just, what do we do? We put our foot harder on the pedal and keep going, particularly as women, right? We just try and kind of forge through. So from a leadership standpoint, it's so important to recognize what your team has been through and to confront that reality because when things are, are uncertain, kind of anxiety and fear can metastasize in the minds of your employees very quickly. So whatever the reality is, it's very important that you confront it, you're empathetic about it, and that you provide this balance of kind of realism and optimism, right? So it's, it's what I love about this work is there are clear implications and things that can help us as humans, as women, as people, and then there are things that are very, very important that can help us as leaders and managers as well. Do you think, women are impacted differently in times of tri crisis and trauma? And, and if so, what else does that mean we need to do to, to readjust? Hugely. Well, I mean, I, again, I know New Zealand is fortunate to be in a bit of a better place, but uh, Alia has this great line, which I'll, I'll steal from her. <laughs> the one, the first thing she said is, you know, crisis takes you as it finds you and where it finds mm. you. So some of us were in great shape when this crisis hit and we had our feet underneath us and we were feeling <laughs> feeling quite quite strong and others of us were not we were a little bit on our back foot and then boom this thing happened so crisis unfortunately doesn't knock on your door and say oh hey you need it here I'm going to show up in June can you get your act together please and then you know we'll head into crisis together that's just not how it rolls so you have to you know it it takes 
finds us as it finds us. And then a crisis is notorious for surfacing all kinds of vulnerabilities and all kinds of inequalities across people. So whatever fault lines sort of existed in your life at the start of this crisis, you can bet your butt they were sort of cracked wide open. And we're really seeing that Penelope here in the data in the United States as it pertains to women. If you look at the uh, most recent McKinsey Women in the Workplace report, the data is quite alarming, like one in three working mothers, one in four working women are thinking of scaling back or quitting because of the of the pressures of this year. And then when you look inside to the black community here who've had disproportionate impact because of COVID, disproportionate impact because of the social unrest, and, and those folks are really saying, look, I don't know if it's worth it anymore for me to keep going. I don't know if I can keep going. So businesses here, really have to appreciate the degree to which women are affected differently. But I think that I think that's true across the board. Um, so I'll, maybe you've got some perspective from a New Zealand angle on that, but it's quite pronounced here in the United States. You know, so I need to share this data with me, plus all of the insights that she's gaining from her extraordinary community over there in the States. But what I'm what we spend some time pondering on is if this is going to be the case, and this is clearly the case, then what are we doing about it? And what is the signaling to us? And I, I actually, again, this is probably my optimistic bias or perhaps my practiced, practice confidence uh, with that sort of matter. I think we have an extraordinary opportunity to now capture this moment and actually say, hey, what, what is this resonating? What is this, what is this echoing? We have had these messages for so very long. We have known that the way in which purpose, work, values, vision aren't articulated in a way that we can connect with. So isn't that giving us an extraordinary opportunity to rethink things, to rethink the way in which work is designed, to rethink the ways in which organizations pay due respect to some of the causes and the purpose that we all are craving to be a part of. Part of me feels as if seeing that we have an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity to capture, that this is a this is a set of data not to frighten us, but to motivate us, to reconstruct things, to rethink things. You know, and so um, we have some of the best talent all over the world that is represented by women. How can we create the opportunity or the conditions within which we all want to be a part of this thing? See, I'm, I'm brought up with a slightly different bias. I'm raised in Bulgaria by an extraordinary man who raised me to believe that being a woman is an enormous gift. And I am, I have extra, extra qualities that I need to capitalize on. And, and to this end, part of me feels as if we are far more creative. We have many more opportunities to connect more broadly. And perhaps this is why we're finding it easier to step away from some of the suffocating or contorting environments that we don't want to be a part of in terms of workspaces. So the question is for all of us to reflect on. If this is what we are voting with our feet on, what does that mean in terms of the context, environments, and propositions for us to create? And we have an extraordinary moment in crisis to capture this momentum and to really go nuts on it, as opposed to observe it from a point of, oh, look, this is impacting us. We've always known it's impacted us. Let's do something with it. So I'm excited. Is this wrong? Is this wrong? <laughs> Am I reading the wrong end of the data? Yeah. No, I, I, th I think, because I, I, I've, I've heard myself you know, companies that were starting to think about flexibility, creating more diverse workspaces, have now really had their hands forced because actually to keep good people in the workplace, people are going, I want to work flexibly. Mm -hmm. I actually want to work flexibly. I just heard um, one of the companies that we work with, um, they've gone to a model, um, they've just merged with another company, they've gone to a model where every Tuesday and Thursday, people work from home. You're going to mm -hmm. try it for four months, see how it works. Um, so trying to put some structure around it, but recognizing that actually people, people are telling them we yeah. want to create change. So I, I, I agree with you both. There's a, a huge opportunity and the companies that get this right will get the right talent, including amazingly talented women exactly. from a, a diverse range of sources. Yeah, it's, it's shifted the game. I mean, the future of work is now here, right? There's no question. It is. There. They're calling it you know, in really hot talent markets like Silicon Valley. You know, some really major companies have said we're not going, we're not going back, right? Twitter have said we're not going back. Microsoft have said we're not going back, perhaps permanently. So they're calling that that remote work will be the quintessential uh, knowledge worker perk of of the next yeah. decade. 
And if you don't offer it, you will be at a loss relative to attracting top talent. I mean, it's a tremendous opportunity for countries like New Zealand. I'm on the board of a, of a huge digital bank in, in Latin America, in Brazil. And they had always sort of leaned, they had a policy of, you know, we're going to speak English first as a way of opening the aperture to attract talent from beyond Brazil. But now they're looking at this sort of going remote first as a, as a further step uh, in order to open the aperture and, um, and uh, widen the net in terms of the type of talent that they could attract to work for a company that's headquartered in Brazil, but you could be anywhere. So it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Sure is. Look, I want to touch on resilience now. We've, we had that in the title. Um, resilience is often considered a great skill to acquire. I worked in higher education for a long time. We'd always talk about students, you know, becoming resilient and being able to go forth in life and be able to deal with anything. The interesting thing is you two are both proposing that actually maybe we should start to rethink what resilience is and how that applies. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, you far ahead. <laughs> oh, goodness, I love this question. And, and, and we can both spend hours talking about this, um, Anita and I. So well, the first thing I wanted to just challenge us on is, is this a skill to acquire? And, and one, of the, one of the challenges that I have found or faced over time when I've been studying and working in this space is that the vast majority of us appear to be thinking of resilience in all the wrong ways. We are thinking of it as this thing that people show and display when they are pushing up a mountain. It's a grit thing, right? This kind of handling it attitude. And that is not resilience. Or, or if this was resilience, then we are playing all the wrong games with life, right? And so my sense, and it's not just the sense, but it's also data and evidence that I've accumulated over time, is that resilience is something that we all have in abundance. You know, some of the founding scholars in this field have forever called it one of the most common miracles. There's nothing extraordinary about resilience. The skill to be acquired is not to develop it or to have more of it. We don't need more of it. The skill to be acquired is not to waste it in all the wrong places. And one of the things that we have uh, willingly or otherwise fallen into as a trap is that tendency to spill it over in all the wrong places, right? And so that tendency to take on more and more of the white noise that is, that is in our environment the tendency to focus more on how do we shift away from where we have been as opposed to explore more broadly what could be. That is what resilience is about. So uh, Anita and I spent a lot of time exploring this topic and, and it is the difference between recovery and resilience, right? And so we need to start shifting our thoughts somewhere between the grieving for what's lost towards anticipation of what could be from worrying about what can happen to wondering about how we can create the sorts of experiences we wish to have in our lives. So the short of it is resilience must be reconstructed. We need to think of it and act with it in a different way. But the sorts of things we have thought resilience is, is not what it actually is and it's not how it actually works. Um, I know Anita has abundance of thoughts on that too. So. First and foremost, Ali, I think it's this, this idea that people normally define resilience as bouncing back. And, you know, one of the first things that I remember learning from you back in March or April is we were saying, look, when you're dealing with ambiguity and things that are changing as rapidly as, as they have this year, you mm -hmm. can't bounce back because there's no bouncing back to what isn't there anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly, again, in the United States, we're coming out of 2020, a different country, like, like, almost regardless of what happens tonight. Um, we are, we're coming out of this. So we can't bounce back to, um, to what, what no longer exists, right? And, you know, so the, even that notion alone, this idea of how can we bounce forward? How can we take what has happened to us and absorb the change, absorb the learnings and come out of it wiser, stronger, more evolved, more grown? Um, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm determined to do coming out of this year, because quite frankly, I think the alternative just won't serve me very well, won't serve any of us very well. So what techniques can we learn and what techniques can you share um, that would better equip us to actually not only survive this ongoing ambiguity and uncertainty, and I mean, this probably won't be our last pandemic, right? right. But, but how do we learn to thrive? What are, what, are the, the, what are the tools and techniques that can help us? Mm -hmm. See, we're both hesitating now because we have so much to share on this. 
I want to think, so let's think about this less as a technique and less as a framework for us to consider. Um, I'd love us to also share some techniques that each and every one of us can employ today in the here and now. But first, let's talk about this ABCD thing that we have been uh, working on. Yes, with, sure. Um, I'd love to. Yeah. yeah, it's more a process than it is a technique. It's a you know? yeah, well, it's not a framework. No, Ali said not a framework. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, but so four elements to this awareness and we tapped into this earlier awareness of where i am and what's around me and who is around me belonging anita is going to have so much to say about belonging but at the very essence of this is understanding what it is that captivates inspires and fuel us is absolutely critical in situations like this doubly so if we aiming to thrive as opposed to kind of recover from some sort of setback the next element that really does matter is sourcing the right kinds of capabilities in order for us to take on the terrain that we have decided we need to be taking on. And I'd argue through all of my research and experiences that the most important capability for us to harness in times of crisis is curiosity. Curiosity though is not something that happens by accident, right? Mm -hmm. It needs to be something that emerges in an environment where you feel trusted and that you can trust. And so choosing the right place to be is critical. And the next stage is force is drive. So here we're speaking of the ABCD model, awareness, belonging, curiosity, and drive. This takes a number of iterations sometimes, and it takes a ton of pausing, but it becomes a lot easier when we allow ourselves the space to actually be intentionful, decisive, purposeful in the way we engage with what we've got. Uh, and to also be aware and to be I guess unapologetic around maintaining whatever equilibrium we can gain in the space that we currently are in. So it takes a little bit of discipline, but it takes all of the good things to kind of source so that we can move forward with it. Yeah. Anita, I want to leave some space for you to, to be well, able to- Well, look, you know, one of the words I'm really hooking on, the more we, we talk about this, Alia, is like this word of being unapologetic. And I think that's a word that for women, first off, we have got to get that into our heads. There are certain things at times like this that we need to be unapologetic about, right? And one of them is just giving ourselves the time to, to sort of go through ABCD. So if we think about A, it's awareness, right? So we've talked about the importance of self-awareness. What do I have? What do I need? What do I come with? What have I learned? Right, but, but sort of awareness of self, but then there's also situational awareness, right? How has my life changed? How has my environment changed? How has my context shifted? And what is that now demanding of me? So it's this combination of, yep, I need to know myself, and I need to know what strengthens me, what broadens me, what depletes me. I need to know what triggers me. But then I also need to know what, what, where the situational awareness comes in. And just to bring that back into the business lens for a second, for those of us who are business leaders, the situational awareness piece, if you think about it, if each individual was really tuned into self-awareness and situational awareness, situational awareness is if you roll it up at a team level, means that everybody is sharing their vantage point of what they see happening and if you're at the top of an organization looking down at the chaos that is 2020 you will have your own perspective on it but as, as Alia likes to say if you're on a battlefield there's very little merit to having everybody look at the problem through the same set of binoculars right you want to have everybody's perspective on what is going on and you want to have people willing to tell you what they what they think is going on I remind CEOs all the time that snow melts from the outside in. So if you're sitting on top of your iceberg, you really do want to be hearing what's happening at the front line with customers, with those employees as well. So that's the self-awareness and situational awareness can actually become a strategic asset for an organization if you build a culture where people are willing to share what it is that they're seeing, what it is that they're feeling. And that then, of course, dovetails immediately into belonging, which, you know, this is what sparked Alia and I's collaboration was this belonging breakfast we did in March. And what I learned from Alia about belonging was I thought I knew, I thought I understood it, and I thought I understood it in the context of diversity and inclusion and belonging. And then Alia went, oh, no, 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 no. Belonging's not this warm and fuzzy HR stuff, Anita. Belonging is actually really about peak performance, about productivity. And I'm like, come again? And, and she, so, so what I've, you know, Alia can elaborate on this, but what, what I've, again, to put it in the business context, belonging is tested in a crisis. 
because all of our employees were running in a race and we got tripped up this year through no fault of our own. And some people will pick their heads up, dust themselves off and just start running again. Other people are picking their heads up, taking a look around, dusting themselves off and going, why was I even running in this race in the first place? <laughs> like, I don't even really like what I would do. I don't miss the three hour commute, right? So it starts to raise all of these existential questions in people's minds. And the biggest one being what's holding me here, mm -hmm. right? Why should I stay? So this, this idea of belonging, this connection to a, a purpose, this feeling of being part of something bigger than yourself, this feeling that work is a place that enables you to be your best and fuels you and replenishes you as opposed to draining you, that becomes really important at times like this. And I'll give you have a, a like brilliant line, which is, you know, belonging to these teams that you've studied is like what gravity is to an astronaut. If you don't have it, you will break apart and, and drift off. So that's where the stuff that we have studied from, you know, the ABCD model, I see direct applicability in, and this is why we're very excited. We're going to work on a book together on this. Um, so we will be coming, New Zealand, watch out, coming back. Yeah. <laughs> um, Agnes, you book it in right now. Um, but, but I see direct applicability in terms of, of some of the really valuable lessons in leadership, uh, you know, in leadership at times like this from from abcd so mm -hmm. uh, yeah i'm going to I, that's a teaser on a and b but you have got to uh you've got to give them the story of of how c came to be shall i shall i say, share the story yes do and and the only reason why i'm, I'm a little bit sheepish about it and here is why anita keeps challenging me to share as many examples as possible and i have over the last 24 hours had an aha moment as to why i'm so hesitant and here is why when we when it comes to crises the sometimes the the examples that we tend to share are captivating they capture our attention but then within each and every one of us we kind of have this thing that our friend finnegan keeps challenging us on you know i hear you had similarities with your challenge and my challenge but my challenge happened on a wet wednesday morning so it was a bit more wicked than yours so i'm just gonna forget that story and remember it as a netflix series but i do want to <laughs> share a little something something that we i i'm challenged to share a lot um, my obsession with curiosity and the link between curiosity and resilience emerged spontaneously and probabilistically in the middle of Syria. I was um, a UN military observer there uh, and, and we were in an extraordinary mission that had been there for a very, very long time. Several trials, and by that I mean acute trials later, myself and two others were taken hostage um, in an area within Syria, uh, an area perched up on the top of the mountain between these stunning villages called Braika and Birajam. Whilst they were remarkable in terms of history, over the previous six months, this area had become a hotspot for warring parties. And we were right in this channel between some of these, uh, I guess, fractions colliding as one. So incredibly hotspot. We had spent our time observing and in the middle of the night, one May, we became the observed. So three of us were taken hostage. Three of us were unarmed, as in we didn't wear weapons, and we were taken hostage by 38 armed military militia members whose intent was to make a bad video of us. And I do this gesture every time because that's what they said to us. Videos of decapitation were used very commonly between warring parties to demonstrate commitment to their mission. Several phases and stages of the journey later, what had emerged is that serendipitously we had managed to find a connection with our captors. And that may seem in the face of it very difficult. You know, you don't go about seeking connection with someone who could be your worst adversary. But in this particular in in instant, we couldn't help not to because when you are soaked in that shared experience of adversity together for a period of time, you begin to notice as many nuances as you possibly can that connect you to that fellow human. That capacity to seek to find what's similar between us. How can I understand your intent a little better? How can I see your needs a little bit more clearly? And how can I see them without being biased by the things that I hold as my interest was precisely the thing that allowed us to be finding our way back to freedom some hours later and some days later. But the beauty of this particular exposure was that it gave us this extraordinary insight into what curiosity allows us to do with situations that appear to be seemingly insurmountable and what does curiosity actually require from our context, from our environment to see us at our best, right? Like resilience, curiosity is one of these things we all have in abundance, 
but it oftentimes is inaccessible because we have a ton of white noise and clutter and stuff that weighs us down. And in these moments of crystal clear acuity, we get to see what it can do. In this particular in instance, it was the discipline to pause long enough, like we keep on saying, and that seems difficult in our day and day, day to day life these days. But when you have that ability to see it in the moment of acute stress, it shows us that we can do it all of the time. So the ability to pause, to inquire, to explore, to recognize, reorient, re-anchor before you re-engage is what really got us out of trouble. But what that took me on personally is that seven year journey of discovering what does curiosity do to the human mind? What does it do to teams? What does it do to organizations that are challenging themselves to create as much space as possible curiosity that is authentic, that as Anita pointed out, is actually a part of that authentic bucket of wealth that each and every one of us brings to the equation. Um, so curiosity is my favorite topic, other than resilience and belonging, but an extraordinary opportunity for us to play with, um, seeing that we all have it in abundance too. As I like to say, um, curiosity killed the cat and saved Alia. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that is a, an amazing story of actually um, extreme trauma and, and adversity. And actually having, I, I think the interesting thing about pausing and giving yourself the moment to think clearly, and also um, something you touched on earlier, which sometimes can be forgotten, unfortunately, is that humanness and yeah. trying to find that connectedness. And, and your word was belonging. Yep. yep. And what, we, and it is curiosity, Penelope, about what sits in the mind of another human being, right? And, um, you know, people that can that can tap into that level of intrapersonal curiosity can actually find common ground with somebody. And yes. in the workplace, if you actually have the capacity to try and see where somebody else is coming from, what is their, the source of their resistance? Why are they not cooperating? Why are they difficult to work with? Um, that actually, uh, that ability, that is a skill kind of like that ability to remain curious about another human being and what's in their mind, where are they coming from? <clears throat> that allows you to find common ground that allows you to co-create and, and find solutions together. And those people actually are very, very valuable in an enterprise because they're more resourceful, right? And they can, they can get more out of other people because they manage to stay open-minded. And, you know, I look at, I look at where we're at in the, in the United States here tonight in particular, and you just wish that more of us could remain, you know, curious about what sits in the mind of the people that perhaps didn't vote the way that we did. Um, can I, can I share something else that just happened to me last week? Sure. So last week, um, I met one of my heroes, which is the coach for uh, the New Zealand women rugby sevens. And the reason why I've loved this human being so much, even though I haven't met him before up until um, a few moments ago, was he coined together with his team this principle or this sort of mission statement for the team for our extraordinary female seven players. That's, that's rugby Anita as well. Uh, leave mana in your wake. So every time they engage with anyone, walking through an airport, walking down the road, engaging with one another, their mission is to leave mana, which is basically not power, respect for everyone around them, right? No matter what the engagement is, even if this is the group that they're fighting against. And he was talking about, he was challenging us to reconstruct that concept of, oh, we just don't have time to be connecting. We just can't connect. We're so busy. Look at my schedule. I've got 40 hours of billable hours. The rest of the time is just schmoozing with clients for some of the corporates that we were working with. And he kind of looked at us sideways and went, well, no, nah, I'm not really buying this and made us ask these four questions yesterday. How are you? Wait, how are you really? How can I serve you better? But beforehand, how are we? And they get to do that all of the time. And so in that space of opening, you know, really opening, really looking into another person's eyes, really making the space to hear about their perspective and their experience, the deepest connections are formed whereby they are capable of winning. We speak of the old blacks, but these girls have 97% win rate on mm -hmm. Anita the smell of an oil rag. They've got very little resource, you know, and most of them have to have the babies there on the side of the pitch whilst they're competing. It's an extraordinary story of success. We need to write about it. Um, but I just love this. And, and, and they wouldn't buy a minute of our hesitation around this time business that we all seem to be so very deprived by, you know, it's just that they, they recognize that when we are busy with lack of time, we're just stressed out. And perhaps we like the discipline to kind of go pause, recognize, 
reorient Priyanka. Like, well, you're back there then into, you know, you mentioned the magic word of discipline, which is really what the what the letter D is about, the drive piece of it. And, you know, what what you learn when you look at these elite teams is that they are far more disciplined about where they spend their time, where they spend their energy, where they spend their resources. They don't have excess time, energy and resources to be spreading, you know, as we say, like peanut butter all over the pan. And in the corporate world, we can be incredibly sloppy about who we engage in what and for what reason and in what way. So I'll give you an example. This is sort of as we, as our friend and I are like, how does this meet my life on a wet Wednesday morning? So last Wednesday morning, wet Wednesday morning here in New Jersey, I was on a board call with the Brazilian company and there were three of us from the board on, 16 people from the, from the company, six of them spoke for two hours and the other 10 were on the Zoom and they said nothing. And, and I just couldn't help. I had algae in the back of my mind going like drive, discipline, prioritization. Are we being intentionful? And I was like, it, that was a waste of, of basically 20 hours of, of time there for those you know, 10 people. So I think we need to be particularly cautious as managers right now to recognize that one, if people are already depleted, we certainly cannot be tasking them with stuff that is, as Alia calls it, white noise. Right? We need to be rigorous about expectations and prioritizations. And the secondly, you know, as certainly we're coming into the Christmas holidays, the winter break here, we have got to be unapologetic about rest, recovery, respite. Because mm -hmm. as I think Analia was at Gilbert from the All Blacks said, you know, being unapologetic about rest and recovery is what allows you to be your best when your best is needed. Mm -hmm. And it also allows you the time and the space again to process what you've actually been through and to process what you're gearing up for. So I think particularly in the US culture, we are very much like a driven person is a busy person. And, you know, the, the were so busy is the new crazy. Like, that's just not the essence of success at all. It's actually the essence of success is being far more disciplined about um, where you spend your time and your energy and being absolutely unapologetic about the need to find your equilibrium and to take rest and to replenish yourself in whatever way feels authentic to you, that is critical to, to sustainable success. I mean, it just makes me, if I can just add one more reference, um, you know, in any time this is essential, but in times of crisis, particularly when that's unfolded for such an excessive period of time, it'll continue to be our case, What's needed from us is to be able to pivot. We have to be pivoting constantly. And we are great pivoters, but you can't pivot well and you can't be firm on your feet and pivot straight up if you are carrying the world of the weight of the world on your shoulders, right? And so this is where that concept of white noise, endless dusty folders filled with agendas and Zoom meetings for two hours where you do nothing else but worrying about where your child is at become completely redundant, right? So what is our aim? If our aim is to pivot stronger, better in a direction that we all want to be thriving in, then there is absolutely no justification for us to be carrying all of that weight upon us. Um, we have a lot of work to do in cutting out the white noise and decluttering, I think. Hmm. Um, thank you. We're, we're going to come to questions in just a moment. So I'd like the audience sitting out there listening to this fantastic corridor. Um, to think about what they'd like to ask either Anita or Alia. Um, just in a summation, because I mean, you've covered so much kind of rich territory and um, gosh, there's so many wonderful things that we could kind of latch onto and apply to life or leadership. Can you, can you kind of encapsulate that into sort of a nice, neat little package takeaway? Um, a, little, a little Uber Eats treat um, I know we've got the A, B, C, D, but um, into a, a nice takeaway so that we can actually get through this time of uncertainty and ambiguity. And, and certainly as Anita, um, it's going to be a very interesting time in the country you now reside uh, for the next wee while. Um, so coming back to my question, um, can you kind of give us some kind of top, top four or five takeaways for people to kind of take away today that they can potentially apply to life and leadership? Mm -hmm. I'll let you go first. It's a home game for you. It's an away <laughs> game for me. <laughs> but you're putting me under pressure now, Anita, because we have so much goodness. To, wait, I, I know. It's amazing. <laughs> because, because we started, because we went to Syria, let's start with the one thing that I think was walking from my mind as I was moving up to safety. Um, mind where your mind goes is a phrase that kind of stayed with me the whole way through. And I wonder if it's Dr. Zeus or original thought, not Dr. Zeus, but... The interesting part of this 
we need to be really, really clear as to what occupies our thought process or what occupies our emotional range every single minute of our day, particularly when we have been preoccupied with so much negativity for so long. Let's mind where our mind goes. For our mind to go places we want to be at, we need to begin by decluttering the space that we are in. And this is where that point that Anita is bringing in so strongly and beautifully, that reference around being unapologetic about maintaining our equilibrium needs to be a starting point. So let's relocate our equilibrium, not the one that belongs to your neighbor or to your cousin, but your own, against your own spinal belief that defines you. Then mind where your mind goes, and then go about exploring a little bit more of that unbridled curiosity terrain of how can I go about fulfilling the mission, the vision, the, the purpose that's, that fuels me. No one else is going to live this life for us, and we might as well make it purposeful. So my favorite three are these, I think. Fantastic. Um, they're good ones. I, I think, I mean, I'll just compliment all these ones. Uh, I love the, um, not a lot matters, but what matters matters a lot. <laughs> and that for me is, is my big takeaway from 2020. I mean, I think that's certainly one Penelope because I'm determined to come out of this year, not looking to bounce back, looking to bounce forward. This was a year where, you know, 9 billion people kind of found themselves on the same page for the first time, maybe not all in the same paragraph, or the same time, but we're on the same page. Right? It was a stark reminder of the fragility of life. It was a stark reminder of the humanity of the interconnectedness of us all. And um, it would be a team, it would be a shame to squander the crisis and not come out of it knowing what really matters to you as a human being and what matters in your life. So I, I think that's one takeaway. And for me, the other is sort of, you know, vulnerability is the new strong, right? It's, it's like, it's, it's a sign of strength and not weakness to ask for help when you need it. And it's a sign I've been encouraging everybody at work, you know, to have a, have a buddy, you know, as you would if you were diving. And just so that's somebody that you can go to to say, I'm low on gas today. Can you, can you, can you, can I take a loan of your oxygen mask for a little bit? If you've got a gas, if your if your tank is full of gas today. Um, so there are probably be this, the two things for me is just to be um, really cognizant of what matters to you. And then to be unapologetic about asking for what it is you need to get there. Thank you. I'm, I'm, um, there is so much content in here. It is phenomenal. And we are, uh, for the people that are sitting out there listening, we are recording this. So you will be able to access this through the Global Women website um, to be able to replay some of these great insights um, and, and, and great kind of tips, really, for us to kind of get through this, this next stage of um, whatever is going to happen. Um, and we are very fortunate in New Zealand, super fortunate. Um, I think we all know that. Um, so I'm waiting for you to uh, post some questions. Um, we haven't got any at the moment, and I can't believe that you're sitting out there without um, wanting to ask a few questions of our fabulous, insightful talent today. So um, think about something that you'd like to ask either Alia or Anita as it applies to your own life um, or as it applies to your role as a leader, um, and we can potentially pick up on, on some of those themes. So oh, I'm going to. Oh, you're so good. Pardon? I love well, some I, of the comments. Thank you, Anna. Hi, Anna. Oh, I think awesome. um, I think you've covered so much that um, maybe people just don't know where to start. I hope that's a good sign. Everybody is so captivated; they don't have time to write questions. It's great. But I look. I think the the very exciting thing for me and Ali is that we're just so thrilled to be working together now. And uh, you know, when we write this book and you know, head to the New York Times bestselling list and go on our global book tour. <laughs> we have all kinds of dreams for ourselves. We're going to do Super Soul Sunday with Oprah. We're going to do everything. Um, Fantastic. And we'll, and we'll say, oh gosh, we had you. We had the privilege of having you here and interviewing you before that. Of and course. Yeah. <laughs> Anna, Anna has called out, uh, in life you can either choose to be busy or remarkable. You can't be both. Focus on being remarkable. We are doing it. <laughs> we are doing it. Thank Thank you. Anna. I love it. Love it. There's a question from, from Natalie. Yeah, I'm just having a look at that. Question. Mm. So maybe you want to take this. How can I support others when their tank is low? Oh my goodness. Natalie, what, a, what an incredible question. And it is incredible because we need to be paying attention a ton more on this. I'm going to go into something we reflected on yesterday as well. Uh, and, and it kind of dates back to the time when I did some clinical, some of my clinical training. Um, the one thing I remember the most from this training when I was trying 
frizzled to work out the solution to as many problems as I thought I'm going to encounter in life as a psychologist. My, my uh, I guess, coach uh, advised me after a while. She said, humans don't need you to be an expert. They don't need you to offer them some kind of a solution. They need you to just be an averagely good human. And I love that because even yesterday, 15 years on, we had these extraordinary leaders who were basically saying, you know, hey, you know what? Sometimes I go to the coffee machine and I freak out because someone will come with a question and I'm thinking, come on, coffee, fill the cup, fill the cup, fill the cup. I want to bail out. I don't know if I'm going to be able to give the best response. All that we need sometimes is acknowledgement. Acknowledgement, tiny bit of space. We don't need to hold the solutions. We just need to hold the space safely. So let's focus more on being an averagely good human and let's see where that takes us because that also fuels our bucket of resilience as well. Every time we display compassion, empathy, love and grace towards others, in, on a very basic psychological level, we gain the same in abundance. Um, so thank you so much for this gorgeous question. And I think and also, Ali, it's like this, this idea of, you know, having empathy for people is different than showing empathy, right? And you actually need to show people that you empathize with their situation. Um, mm -hmm. And those, those just little random acts of kindness right now, that, that little personal note that picking up the phone and making that little phone call on the days when you have the, ga the gas in your tank to be able to do that. There's days when I don't. And I just, I just know that if I could stay in my pajamas and and, you know, uh, I'm not in my pajamas today. Today, I even put perfume on, like I did my hair. This is a big day. <laughs> <laughs> a big day. Great. Perfume <laughs> on through this global women gig. Um, but, but on the days when you have it, you know, show that, gorgeous. You, Both of you. <laughs> show that you have, show that you have, um, you have empathy for those around you. And to share, I think, Ali, you always say, you know, build strength from strength within. So knowing where your sources of strength are and building from them and then offering that strength to others on the days when you have it in, in an area where they need it as well. Um, but I loved also the question there, I think from Nikki and what advice do you provide when to keep yourself on track professionally and personally? Um, I don't know exactly quite how to answer that, but I will say there is a book that I love, a good friend of mine wrote called uh, Drop the Ball. And I read it actually when I was on maternity leave. It was probably the best book I could have possibly read when I was on maternity leave. And, uh, and it's written by a good friend of mine, Tiffany DeFoo here in the United States. And Tiffany sort of one liner about this. She's married to Koji, she, she and, and he have two kids. And she said, I'm asked all the time, what is the secret to my success and being a successful woman? She's an entrepreneur and an author and all that speaker and everything. And she says very simply, I expect far less of myself and far more of my husband than most other women. And I love that line. So it's like, that, that's one of the things you can do to, to help keep yourself on, on track, I think, is just set your expectations in a way that are, that are moderate and realistic. I think we've got a quite a good, oh, sorry. Was, there's quite a good question from Chantelle. Um, she loves uh, vulnerability as the new strong. What else would you both consider to be the new strongs for the future? Mm -hmm as a result of the strange and challenging year? Great question. Oh, I love it. Great question. Can I connect what Anita was just going, what, what she was giving us earlier about that track? How do you stay on track? Uh, with the next question that came through, which is what is the new strong? Uh, and one of the people that we work along with, and, and I cannot believe how lucky we are, is the grandson of Viktor Frankl, the person who wrote Men's Search for Meaning. And so we had him in the audience as well, uh, several times but one of the things that he keeps on reminding us is guess what you don't you know that track that might not even be yours go ahead and construct it purpose meaning starts first like you know yeah. we, we always say with anita purpose precedes drive so rather than trying to get yourself glued onto a path pause a second and work out whether that path is even yours to be on you know so find mm -hmm. your purpose purpose is the new strong in the absence of purpose, with this absolutely like every sign and signal that our bodies and brains are giving us that we are depleted, suggest that perhaps this isn't fueling you or that this is taking more than it's giving you. So let's be a bit more, again, back to Anita's word, unapologetic about that and, and work out what is it that our purpose is, our personal purpose. Um, and, and to me, that is most certainly the new strength, right? When you are there, when you are near it, nothing can push you off the perch because you can get there many different ways, but you are on the right track and you feel fueled by it. So purpose first. Mm. Yeah. 
Fantastic. There's another question in here about love this concept of bouncing forward. How can we support other leaders to bounce forward rather than scrabbling to get back on hold, uh, to get back and hold on to the way we just used to do things? And there is a lot of that going on at the moment. That seems to be trying to get their own equilibrium back. Yeah, and Ali and I actually did a did a session on this last week on this whole idea of why is change harder in times of change, um, and so Ali, you can you can elaborate on on that if you want a little bit. But look, I think one of the things I think, and, and Penelope, you just asked a question before this about you know, what is the, what is this thought is about leadership qualities that we need going forward. Um, so I'll take a crack at that one, then Ali, maybe you can do the why is change hard in times of change because I know you have a beautiful answer on that. Um, there's no question, and quite frankly, some of this has been very evident from the leadership in your country, but there's no question that there is room for empathetic leadership now, right? Um, this is a challenge near where you have to leaders have to manage polarities right where you have to be you have to be courageous and be seen to move forward but you also need to be thoughtful and 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 you know not reactive to things you need to be vulnerable and, and empathetic to people but you also have to be resilient and strong i mean there's this sort of like mm. people feel like you know they have to find this balance but empathy is huge um, transparency is really important to people when things are confusing and murky and ambigu you know, amb ambiguous. Transparency is hugely important. But I'm going to come back again, um, Penelope, to a variation of curiosity, right? Because curiosity, call it whatever you want in a business context, it's only possible if you have humility to start with, right? To recognize that you don't have all the answers. And in fact, if we're in, 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 in by definition, if we're in an in era that's unprecedented, well, then all of our prior experience is somewhat irrelevant to begin with, right? So having the humility to recognize that. And I love, I think I've shared with some of the Global Women audience before, but I love this uh, this story I read once actually in the acknowledgement section of a book uh, by a Harvard professor. And she, she wrote this book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And um, she spent 10 years working on it. And she was about four years in when her house went on fire and she lost everything, all of her notes. This was back oh. in 2000, 2011, I think. Um, and she describes in the book that the night of the blaze, she ran around her house, closing as many doors as she could to stop the spread of the blaze before she and her family evacuated. And then later on, as she stood outside, everyone's safe, and she stood outside with her health, her house was engulfed in flames. She said, you know, it never occurred to me that I was closing doors to rooms that would no longer exist. So mm -hmm. I always bring that story into my boardrooms to challenge myself and to say, am I spending time here? Am I driving the conversation towards co consideration of doors, be they opened or closed, to rooms that may long, no longer exist? Or am I thinking about the exploring and the possibility and staying open-minded about all of that and letting the answers emerge if they're not predictive? So I think that's a great challenge for leaders. And it takes curiosity, honestly, is just the answer to being able to do that. Um, Alia will give you a whole litany of reasons for why curiosity is a, is a superpower. Um, but I will also tell you personally, I didn't understand at the time, but many of you are familiar with my wisdom cards, which I started when I was on maternity leave with really severe postpartum depression. And they saved my life then because that was how I managed to, to start writing these little cards. I now have 5,000 of them. Um, and I, I read Tiffany's book and I just sort of started reading, started writing. And as Alia has now taught me, you can't be curious and be in fight, flight, freeze mode at the same time. So my curiosity actually lifted me out of, of that depression. And on days when I'm feeling depleted, I come up here to my little corner and I start filling out some cards and it just flips that switch in my brain to get me into curiosity mode, puts a bit of fuel back in my tank, makes me feel like I've learned something and off I go. So that's my little personal way that I manifest curiosity on, in my life on an average wet Wednesday morning, but everybody <laughs> has their own, their own tricks for doing that. Gorgeous. Well, I think um, this has been an amazing hour. Um, thank you so much for your insights. And we've covered some pretty rich territory, and I'm sure that there's something for everyone in the great wisdom that you've imparted. Um, it's been a delight um, being able to um, have a conversation with you um, and to hear what you have to say. All the very best for um, your upcoming book. Um, we'll be watching with curiosity to, to see where that takes you. Um, but 
Thank you so much on behalf of Global Women. You have been an absolute delight. Um, and I've enjoyed and have scribbled down so many things that I know personally I will take away and, and see how they can add value to my life and, and of those around me. So again, thank you so much. Um, have a great evening, have a great day, Alia. And to all of you that were listening today, I'm sure that you've got something uh, very valuable, so, some many things very valuable out of today's Korero. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you again uh, soon at another Global Women event. So thank you and um, have a great day.